Hey, what is up, guys? Welcome to an online edition of Selected Topics Mass Murder. The topic of today is going to be media and mass murder. Particularly, we're going to be talking about the media's presentation of mass murder and also the possible effects that the, its presentation has on our understanding of the phenomenon. Before we get to that, however, I want to talk about April 21st, which is the next time we meet. Uh, April 21st, uh, several important things, it's an important day, but for several reasons. First, uh, we have the final quiz that day, so make sure not to miss that. We're also going to have the final lecture, uh, and definitely don't miss that one. And also, we're going to have presentations by Rich, Emily, and Joe. Make sure, uh, to Rich, Emily, and Joe, make sure that you email me your PowerPoint lectures uh, by 11 p.m., Thursday night. So make sure not to miss April 21st. A lot of things are happening that day. Um, all right, so let's get on with the presentation. Uh, media, uh, you know, all sorts of media, whether printed or televised media, but media is an essential part of American life, primarily because we depend on the media for our understanding of the world. Uh, by some latest estimates, about 95% of the U.S. population regard the media as the primary source of information about politics, sports, the economy, and crime. Now, this is really important because it means that if 95% of us are getting almost all of our information about crime and all other aspects of life from the media, it means that our understanding of those phenomenons are shaped by the media, right? It is shaped by the, the, the types of cases that the media decides to present on, in which they just decide not to present to us. It is, the, uh, it is our understanding of the phenomenon. Uh, it's, it's affected by how much of, of, their, of air time they devote or page time in, temp, in, in the case of printed media, how much space they devote to crime. Um, and, and obviously, but how frequent they, uh, they, how frequently they present to us stories about crimes. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, crime is very appealing, not only, uh, it's a very appealing to the public, and the media has, you know, learned that, uh, that if they they get better ratings whenever they show stories about crimes, particularly the more the higher the ratings, uh, the more egregious the crime, the higher the ratings. And for that reason, in the last 100 years, you've seen an increase of the, in the prominence of crime news. For instance, in 1920, only 10% of all crimes were uh, of all news were crime related. By 1960, that went up by uh, 20%. That went up to 20%. And by the year 2000, 35% uh, of all news were crime uh, related. We can only imagine that uh, since the year 2000, with the spread of the internet uh, through almost every home, uh, and every person in America with the advent of social media and the multiple 24-hour news channels that, uh, you know, this shared of, 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 of crime stories, right, the, 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 the space taken by crime in, in, in news presentation has only gone up. And so we are now being essentially uh, bombarded Right, we're, we're being bombarded by news stories every single day, right? And those news stories has had a have have had a tremendous effect on our understanding of crime, but also it has had psychological effects on us. Particularly, the biggest effect that the, uh, that you know all these news stories have had on the public um, is fear. Uh, if you are to ask people about, you know, uh, the risk of victimization, they would say that it's very high. We know from research on the perception of risks of crime, we know that people, um, you know, that, 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 that the overrepresentation of crime in the news has distorted our understanding of both the, uh, of the incidents 
of crime, of the likelihood of our of victimization, and primarily because it has emphasized extraordinary crimes. But it also, we believe that these extraordinary crimes, that these crazy, egregious crimes are mostly the norm. Here in this figure, uh, this is something really, really interesting. Uh, in 2002, they um, they interviewed, they surveyed people and asked them about to rate the probability of being victimized, of being fallen victim of different crimes, burglary, theft of a car, theft from a car, mugging of robbery, physical attack by a stranger. And the darker blue represents the person's guess as to their victimization risks. And as you can see, it's fairly high. Uh, now, the light blue represents, or green, represents their actual uh, risk of victimization. So, there's obviously something very wrong here, where people are perceiving themselves to be at high risk of being victimized, victim of a crime, yet in reality, their risk is quite low. Um, if you actually... So this, this, you know, this is really interesting. If you ever take a class on, uh, if you ever take a class on uh, media presentation of crime, media and crime, uh, you know, it's, it's a fascinating topic. So here are two things that we uh, that that we know from the literature on media and crime: the reality and the perception of victimization. So if you were to, if you were to, uh, um, sort of stack in order, uh, in, from zero to a hundred. Um, the risk that certain groups of people in the population have of, of being victim of a crime, uh, the people with the highest risk of being victim of a crime are young African Americans ages 16 and 24, followed by young whites ages 16 and 24. Now, the people in our in our society, the people that have the lowest risk, the actual lowest risk of victimization, are senior African Americans ages 65 plus and senior whites ages 65 plus and you can sort of fit in the middle because you, the risk of victimization is related mostly to to age right now that's the reality that's what we know based on crime statistics however when you look at uh, people's perception of victimization this relationship totally flips. So you see that uh, senior whites perceive themselves to be at the highest risk of falling victim to a crime, followed by senior African Americans. And the people with the lowest uh, perception of risk are the people that are actually at the highest risk, right? So our perception of reality is so distorted that actually it's literally upside down. And that inverted relationship, this sort of little paradox where the people that are the safest have the the, the perception to be of, of being the highest at the highest risk and the people at the highest risk have the perception of being the lowest risk, um, it's 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 probably the product of uh, of the media. So how does the media create such uh, distortions? This is a really important question. Uh, and it does so by focusing on the most extreme forms of homicide. Literature, uh, the literature on crime and, 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 and murder, crime and media uh, has consistently shown that, but that the more the egregious the crime, the, the harsher the crime, the one, the more likely it is to be presented by the news, to be selected for publication, and also the more coverage it gets. Now, mass murder is really uh, a, a gem when it comes to the news because it represents probably the one of the worst forms of homicide um, that in the United States uh, for many reasons one is because we have you know it, it involves multiple victims right so if he bleeds he leads the more victims the more coverage uh, also because of the quote-unquote random nature usually 
uh, these people, particularly the ones that are more likely to get shown in the news, uh, you know, there, you know, the, there's no relationship between the victims and the perp and, and the perpetrator, and so this random nature, uh, the the random selection of the victims attracts a lot of uh, media attention. Also, the suicide is something that is uh, of interest to people, uh, mental illness, and also automatic rifle. It's 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 a perfect storm of of all the components so all the components that we know attract media attention all the all, all those components are present in uh mass murder and if you look at the number of news articles um uh, throughout the 19th century throughout the 20th century you see that it has been increasing over time so news uh, you know news outlets have picked up on this on the people's interest on these types of stories and they are uh, complying to those demands and feeding the public with those with more uh, stories now it's important to understand that not all mass murders are going to get the same level of attention. Some mass murders get way more attention than others. In fact, some mass murders ha ha are not even presented by the news. So, so what are those factors, right? What are the factors that uh, affect not only what, uh, not only this, the selection, uh, the, the the probability of being selected for publication, but also the, pro the the but also news salience, or meaning the extent of the news coverage. Um, I recently, uh, with my colleague um, uh, Jason Silva, uh, conducted a study uh, on mass public shootings, uh, particularly on the presentation of mass public shootings by national newspapers. And the way that we did this is that, you know, there's so many newspaper outlets that we had to choose one. And the New York Times, we selected the New York Times because the New York Times uh, and its coverage is regarded to be a, a, a very reliable indicator uh, of new outlets. Um, so we selected the New York Times and uh, what we did is that we took my mass my mass public shooting database from 1965 and 2016, and then we searched the name for the names on the New York Times database for each of these perpetrators and collected information on the number of articles and also the number of words within the articles written about each case uh, in my mass public shooting database. So let's go over some of the basic descriptives, right? So this is the incidence of, of mass public shootings from 1966 to 2016, as you've seen this graph before. So from 1966 to 2016, there have been 314 mass public shootings. And as you can see, the incidence of mass public shootings has been steadily increasing since, 19, since the 1970s, almost exponentially after the year 2000. So we've seen these, this graph m many times before. So out of these 314 mass public shootings, only 80% of them were covered by the New York Times. Only 80% were covered by the New York Times. So, so not all mass public shootings get national news, uh, are selected by national news outlets. Um, in total, this, the 80% the that were selected for publication generated about uh, 3,500 articles. Um, if you translate that into words, uh, this 80% of mass shootings that were selected for publication by the New York Times um, generated uh, a bit over 3.5 million words, right? And this is only the New York Times. So the New York Times, from 50 years, has has written 300, I mean 3,510 articles and over 3.5 million words about mass public shootings. This is only one news outlet. So a lot of articles, a lot of words, it's particularly given that there's only 314 incidents, correct? 314 incidents, 14 incidents of mass public shootings have generated all of these different articles and all of these words. That's, an, that's a pretty amazing. Um, so on average, so on average, a mass public shooting will get about 11 or so articles written about them, 
and about 11,000 words uh, also written about them. So uh, quite, a, quite a lot. That's, that's sort of the average. Of course, there's a lot of variability. Some get significantly more, much more um, coverage than that in terms of number of articles and also number of words. If you look at, you know, the, uh, at the percent covered and the average number of articles and the average number of words over time, you see several interesting relationships, right? So this figure here shows you the incidence of mass public shootings. This figure here shows you the percent of those incidents that were covered by the news. So here in 1966, 100% of, of all uh, of the two that happened, where uh, two mass public shootings that happened were covered, and it kind of has gone down a little bit. You can see that the average number of articles written about each mass public shooting has increased over time, just like the average number of words written about each mass public shooting. So there's two things going on here. If you look at the percent covered, you see you see that uh, it is declining a little bit, which means that mass public shootings today are less likely to be covered than it was in the 1960s and 70s. There could be many reasons for that. Prima probably the fact that there's so many that are happening today compared to 1966. In 1966, 1970s, these were very, very rare events. And so uh, you could, because they were so rare, because they were so very few, they're probably attractive a lot of, uh, they, they were probably going to get attention either way. Today, that's not the case. Today, we, an average in about 20 mass public shootings per year. And so because there are so many, relatively so many, uh, news uh, organizations can be a little bit more selective. So the percent of our mass public shootings that are covered have been declining over time. Um, however, even though the percent of mass public shootings that have been covered have been declining over time, the average number of articles and an average number of words have been increasing over time. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, and, you know, it, it, it kind of shows you that, you know, the New York Times, it's become, it, it, it's writing more about mass public shootings. Um, and, and that's because they see that people are interested. But here you have sort of a paradoxical situation where the percent cover has gone down a little bit, yet the percent number of articles has increased. So that suggests to me that there's at the sensitizing effect. There's so many that we, the news organizations have become desensitized and they choose to only cover the more appealing ones. Yet, whenever they choose to write about one, they write a whole lot of words about those shootings. In this figure, um, I am showing you the top 15 uh, most news producing mass public shootings. These are the top 15. These are the 15 mass public shootings that have generated the most uh, news coverage. The number one, the one that has generated the most coverage is the Columbine High School shooting, which happened in 1999. That new, the, the New York Times wrote five, about 500 articles on the Columbine High School shooting and also uh, that which translated to about 500,000 words. That is followed by the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in 2012, which generated not as much, but it generated 248 articles and about 250,000 words. The Colorado Theater shooting in 2012 generated 212 and 200,000 words. The Tucson shooting, San Bernardino, Virginia Tech, Orlando Club, Charleston Church shooting, Fort Hood shooting, Long Island Railroad shooting, West Side Middle School shooting, all the way to down to the Texas Tower shooting in 1966, which generated 32 articles um, in the New York Times uh, to a total of 41,000 41, words. And as you can probably imagine, as you go through these shootings, you probably know most of them. You probably remember... Uh, most, if not all, and the reason why you remember these shootings is because of all the coverage that it generated. And this is just the New York Times. This is not counting TV. This is not counting any other um, newspaper organization. Um, the other thing that 
you know that should become clear is just how many if you if you sum all these up if you sum all the total articles from these 15 uh, mass shootings and all the total words from these 15 mass shootings just how much of the total uh you know um, the, the total news coverage uh, is generated by these 15 cases so if you look at the number of the total number of articles for all mass public shootings 69 percent of them were generated by this top 15. 69 percent of all news of all news articles gen, uh, for all 314 mass public shootings were generated for the 15 cases that we were just talking about the other 299 cases generated 31 percent of the total the same with the words, right? The top 15 mass public shootings that we were just discussing generated 72% of the total number of words, right? Uh, and and, and the, the bottom 299, the other 299 generated 28% of the words, right? This is astonishing, right? About 70% of all the information on mass public shootings um, is driven by 15 cases, right? 70 percent, which means that about 70 percent of our understanding of mass public shootings come from 15 cases. This is really, really, really important. 70 percent of all information about mass public shooting is generated by 15 cases. And if you remember those 15 cases, if you look at those 15 cases, those 15 cases uh, are ex are very extreme in terms of the number of kills and the characteristics of the offender, how they were committed, and mental illness. These are very atypical cases, very atypical cases. These cases look nothing like the average mass public shooting. Yet our understanding of the whole phenomenon and the policies that we are established uh, they come primarily from the information we get from these 15 cases. I want you to really think about that because that's really, really important. And that's not just mass public shootings, that's all other types of, uh, of crime, right? Most of our understanding is being generated by the most egregious forms of crime. So now, now that we discussed that, let's talk about... Um, about you know what characteristics so I want to talk about two things right uh, the, the number one the first thing is there's two different there's two different steps that we have to think about um, the, the, the first one is news selection which cases are selected for publication right uh, why is it that one case is presented by the New York Times and another case is not presented by the New York Times and then the other the other major question is uh, news salience or coverage, the extent of the coverage. What is it about? Why is, why is it that some cases get one, 400, 500 different articles and another case gets only two articles, right? So in, in, in the paper that I worked on with my co-author Silva, I wanted to, um, you know, sort of understand what characteristics of mass murder, particularly mass public shootings, um, determine which shootings get covered by the news right so let's answer that so to for that analysis i looked at different um uh, characteristics i looked at the gender of the uh, offender the age of the offender i looked at whether or not the offender had mental illness uh the relationship between the victims and the offender meaning did they have a relationship or is it completely random did the person attack people at random um, is it terrorism related, meaning the, the offender was the offender motivated by ideological extremism? Uh, also, we also took into consideration the location, whether it happened in a business, whether it happened in the government agency, whether it happened in school, uh, in, a, in a religious institution, that, uh, how many firearms were used number of fatalities, number of injured victims. Also, uh, the region of the country which it happened, whether it was the Northeast, the South, the West, the, the Midwest. And this is important because the New York Times is a national news organization, but, you know, there's still the chance that, you know, they're more likely to present 
cases and give more coverage to cases that happen in the Northeast just because the New York Times headquarters happens to be located in the Northeast, right? So there's some spatial bias going on there. Uh, and also, we also looked at the race of the offender. So when we conducted our analysis, and I will spare you the details about you know the, the statistical techniques that we use and and the, the statistical challenge that we faced, but uh, when we use our statistical techniques, which is regression, uh, we found that several things were significant. So these factors that are in gold or uh, are were significant. So uh, age had a significant effect on the probability of coverage, firearms, fatalities, injured, the region in which it happened, the location in which it happened. Uh, these uh, characteristics had a significant effect. The ones in blue did not have a significant effect. So let's go through each one. Um, we found for, in, for age, we found that, and this is not surprising, we found that younger offenders were significantly more likely uh, to be presented by the news. So the younger the offender, the younger the shooter, the more likely um, uh, that New York Times were going to select that uh, shooting for uh, for publication. We also found that the location in which uh, the shooting occurs also matters a lot, but but only when it comes to schools. We we found that mass public shootings that took place in schools were significantly more likely to be presented uh, by the New York Times. When it comes to firearms, this is not surprising. We also found that offenders that use multiple firearms were more likely to be presented by the news. Um, following, you know, so the, 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 the very famous phrase, if it bleeds, it, uh, it leads, we looked both the number of fatalities and the number of injured victims had the biggest impact uh, when it comes to the probability of being selected. So those mass public shootings that resulted in a higher number of fatalities and a higher number of injured victims were significantly more likely to be presented by the New York Times, which is not surprising. Um, we also found evidence in spatial bias. We found that uh, mass public shootings that have, that occur in the Northeast are significantly more likely to be presented by the New York Times, as suspected. Right, uh, cases that happen closer to the New York Times uh, New York Times headquarters uh, are, are are going to affect more people from the area, which means that the New York Times will probably be more likely to present those. Uh, those mass shootings in the newspaper. So, the next question was about new salience, right? What characteristics of mass murders determine new salience? And by new salience, I mean the extent of the coverage, how many articles, how many words. So we looked essentially at the same, the same, at the same characteristics, and we found that. You know, several ones were significant, right? And again, age was statistically significant, firearms, number of fatalities, injured, region, race, whether it was terrorism related and the location were significantly associated with the um, with new assailants, with the extent of the coverage. And similar to the first finding, we found that younger offenders, right, younger mass, pub mass public shootings get significantly higher uh, news coverage. We also found that offenders that were ideologically motivated uh, also received significantly higher uh, news coverage. The location matters a lot, right? Um, so we found that shootings that occurred in either in schools or government agencies or religious institutions received significantly higher news coverage. Also, offenders that use higher number of guns receive significantly higher news, uh, higher news coverage. Again, the biggest impact came from the number of fatalities and injured. Uh, at mass public shootings that generated um, higher numbers of fatalities and injured victims also receive significantly higher news coverage, a lot more. Uh, the biggest impact, again, uh, comes from the number of fatalities and the number of injured victims. The region of the country, again, matters a lot. Spatial bias, right? The New York Times, uh, 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 the New York Times, um, 
gives more coverage, significantly more coverage to mass public shootings that occur in the Northeast compared to the West, compared to the Midwest, and compared to the, um, to the South. One interesting thing that we also found is that offenders of Middle Eastern descent get significantly, a lot, a lot more coverage than white uh, African American and Latino and Asian uh, offenders. So let's talk about some of the general conclusions here. Um, the first one is that, you know, given the number of mass public shootings that have occurred in the last 50 years, which is 314, you know, in that context, 314 cases, they have received quite a lot of news coverage. It has been an enormous amount. Uh, we're talking about more than 3.5 million words, over 3,000 news articles on 314 events. That's quite a lot. Particularly when you start thinking about, you know, how rare mass public shootings are. I mean, in reality, we're more likely to die in a car accident than we are to die from a mass public shooting. Uh, the probability is so low, particularly when you compare it to regular homicide. And when I mean regular homicide, I mean a homicide where one person dies. Uh, yet, uh, even the even when the probability is so low, they're still giving uh, a lot of news salience. They're giving a lot of prominence within the news because of the egregious nature of that phenomenon. And again, that makes it more likely that overrepresentation of mass public shootings in the news makes it more likely for people to believe that uh, their risk of being a victim of a mass public shooting is higher than what it really is. So these are the kinds of numbers that really distorts reality, right? 3,500 3, articles to 314 events. That is crazy, a crazy distortion uh, of, of, of coverage given the, the risk. Um, the other conclusion, the other major conclusion, the other major takeaway is that the New York Times have become, at least, you know, you know, the New York Times, and if the New York Times is representative of other national uh, news organizations, then other news organizations have become a bit more selective about which articles, not about which articles, but about which mass public shootings they present in their news. And that has probably to do with the higher number uh, that, that there is today. Um, and so, um, you know, mass, the, the, the percent of mass public shootings that are presented by the news has declined. They're becoming more selective. But in that selection, we know that they're selecting more egregious uh, forms. They're selecting the most egregious of, a, of, a, of an already egregious form of homicide, which, uh, again, distorts our reality, right? Because the typical mass public shooting is not as extreme. So they become more selective, and they write more about those that they select. Again, creating a bigger distortion of reality. The next conclusion is, uh, and this is a big one, right, is that 70% of all coverage is being generated by 15 cases. 70% of all the coverage um, of mass public shootings by the New York Times, and probably by other by other news organizations has been generated by 15. That means that 1% of mass public shootings generates 70% of all the information on the subject. That is crazy, right? And, and if that 1% uh, or less than 1%, if those 15 cases were like the other 299 cases, that probably wouldn't be a problem. But those 15 cases are you know they get the most they 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 got seventy percent of the coverage for a reason. That's because they are the most egregious, most heinous, and most le and most lethal mass public shootings that we've experienced. Uh, and so, and and so, when seventy percent of our understanding comes from one source, from this this the most egregious forms of homicide, then again that's the, that distorts our reality. 
And when that distorts our reality and we start creating policies to prevent the, those kinds of shootings, then we're basing our policies, we're basing our political discourse on the most extreme cases. And good policy can never be uh, uh, created or based on extreme cases. Good policy is based on the typical case, what happens most of the time. And this is why sometimes we come up with very bad policy ideas because these policy ideas come from the most extreme cases, right? Good policy comes from an analysis of all the cases, of uh, having an understanding of what happens on average and we know that that's not our understanding is not based on what happens on average our understanding is based on these 15 cases for the most part we also found the other conclusion is that we also found that individual traits and event level characteristics are predictive of news coverage and news settings. So the so the fact that these fifteen cases generate got seventy percent of the news uh, news coverage is no uh, is not random. It's not luck. It's the fact that the certain characteristics that make certain shootings not only more likely to be selected for coverage, but also um, that um, uh, that affect how much of that coverage they get. Right. Not surprisingly, given these uh, significant characteristics that you know, these characteristics that influence new salience and new news coverage, not so it's not surprising that you know most much of our political discourse, or much of the discourse surrounding mass public shootings, does center around firearms. It centers around uh, schools and and terrorism, uh, particularly jihad-inspired mass public shootings, right? Uh, if when in fact most most ideologically motivated mass public shootings uh, are motivated by, by far-right ideologies, not jihad-inspired. So our understanding of mass public shootings, uh, really, it's it, the public understanding of mass public shootings is, a, you know, it's representative of the stuff that the media is putting out in, day in and day out, right? Um, and until we change that until we're able to shift from the most extreme to the most typical then our understanding will about about mass public shootings and about crime in general and really reality in general will be distorted just because uh, the human mind is trying to make predictions about the the, the incidents the salience of a phenomenon based on how much it encounters it but we know that that's not the case Right. We know that the media over represents certain parts, certain types of phenomena. So we really need to understand that before we can even begin to create policies that will prevent uh, these shootings. All right, guys, uh, we're going to leave it there today. Uh, make sure that uh, you come to class on April 21st. Uh, enjoy. Uh, the day of uh, next week, and I'll see you uh, in a couple of weeks. Take care.